We are going to continue our sermon series today. This is the second week of this series called Words That Matter. And uh, last week we focused on Scripture, which is our foundation. Uh, that's the rock on which we stand. That's out, everything out of which I'll share in the coming weeks is built. And uh, this is kind of a bit of a logical progression this week. I want to talk about the church so I love that little video. I hope you were able to kind of catch the drift of it, the message there. I know it was quick and snappy. It was only a minute and 27 seconds. But the whole point is that the church is not just the building that you're sitting in right now. The church is not just a structure. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. The church is you. It is us. It is the gathered people of God. And so as we launch into this sermon today on the church, I just want to open with a few important points of clarification, and they're going to come up on the screen for you right now. So this word, which we decided to translate church into English from Greek, this Greek word ekklesia, it is pronounced ekklesia, is used 114 times in the New Testament. So I don't think there's a lot of words that are used more than that, other than like the or and or something like that, right? But in terms of important words, this one is way on the top of the list. So 114 times in Scripture, the New Testament, ecclesia means assembly or gathering. Assembly or gathering. Of people. And it was commonly used in the Greco Roman world to describe an assembling of Roman citizens, people who had full citizenship. They were important societal decisions were made in that gathering. Okay? So if you just want to get an image in your head to beginning, to at the beginning of this sermon, is that when the word was used way back over 2,000 years ago, even down 3,000 years ago, the Romans and the Greeks would use this word to describe a gathering of citizens in order to make important decisions in society. And so, the early Christians adopted the word, ecclesia, and applied it to God's gathered people. So right down through the ages, God's gathered people like this here. And so my final introductory point is this. The ecclesia of the living God, we share heavenly citizenship with Jesus Christ. And we gather on earth to worship the Lord Jesus. So I want you to just contrast for a moment the civilization definition of church, ecclesia, and the New Testament definition. So just hold that slide right there for a minute. We share in fellowship with the living God a heavenly citizenship, not a Roman citizenship, not just a Canadian citizenship, for those of you who are Canadian citizens, because there are some people here who may not be Canadian citizens, or the citizens of any country. There's people out there that I'm sure are struggling with the issue of citizenship. So know that if you are a follower of Jesus, you have a citizenship, and it is in heaven with Christ, and it transcends everything of this world. That's at the heart of the redefinition of this word. And we worship the Lord Jesus. The early church did not worship Caesar. The church throughout all of history does not worship earthly lords. We do not worship Justin Trudeau, the, pr the prime minister of Canada. We don't worship leaders of this world. We worship the true leader, Jesus Christ our Lord, and every leader is subservient to Jesus. 
throughout all of history, that is the truth that is embedded in this word church, ecclesia. And so, with that in mind, we will come to the word and we will receive this message this morning. I only want to read a few verses from a bit of a, uh, it's a buried uh, passage in the New Testament. We don't often read this passage, and so I thought it would be really good to read it and start thinking a little bit differently about church. So it's in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and it's verses 14 to 16. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn there with me. And as we come to the word, would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this word, church, this word that describes our relationship with you, Lord, this word that is given to us to describe who we are in Christ as your people, as your household as a people who stand on the truth of the gospel and who worship the true king. And so, Lord, as we come to this strong word this morning, we pray that you will illuminate our minds and our hearts and prepare us to receive everything that you have for us that comes from this word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, this is Paul speaking to his brother Timothy, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the ecclesia of the living God, which is a pillar and a buttress of truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He, Jesus, was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels. He was proclaimed among the nations, he was believed on in the world, and he was taken up in glory. And this is the word of the Lord. And so I want to focus this morning on two specific images that come up in this passage that describe the church. The first is the household of God, and the second is the church as a pillar and buttress of truth. So that's one that I think we don't often think about and is worth reflecting on deeply today. So the first thing is the church is the household of God. This is a very warm and homey and inviting and welcoming image, the household. So the early church took a common secular word that applied the way that I've already explained it in their society, and they reworked this word for their own purposes. And this was one of the purposes. It was to describe God's people as God's household, God's home, the dwelling place of the living God. The New Testament also calls us the temple of the Holy Spirit. So it's the same concept. It is the place where God dwells, the dwelling place. So a common word took on flesh and became a relational image, a relational image that describes home, that describes family, nurture, care, one for another, and the big word is love. So that is what a household ideally should be, right? So you can live in a house, a church can 
meet in a building, but it does not mean that the house is a home. Correct? It does not necessarily mean that. You could, have a, you could live in a house that's a war zone. We can inhabit a church building together that is not a house, but a war zone or something in between. There's a continuum there. And so think about how the word works today. The church is Christ's body. A people who come together and work hard for home, for a dwelling with one another. And it is hard work, right? Laura alluded to that in worship. Sometimes we don't feel it. Sometimes you don't feel joyful. Sometimes you don't feel like loving other people. Sometimes we don't feel like caring for other people. So we've got to work to make the church a home. A local gathering, a community of God's people, spiritually alive in Christ. Remember the point of our citizenship being in heaven with the Lord. So in some way, we've already been vindicated. We've been raised with Christ. We're seated with him. But we are also bound together in God's spirit, as God's people, here and now, and across space and time. So this is the part where things get really kind of spooky with this, right? Because we are connected as God's household to people who are worshiping all over the world right now and also throughout the ages. So there's a spiritual connection through the Holy Spirit that binds us. And one day in the resurrection, we will dwell together as God's people for eternity. That is the ultimate hope of the church as the people of God. And so I want us to pause and think for a moment right now as we're kind of in this thing. Think about what your understanding or your vision of church is? Does your natural or inherited understanding of church line up with what we're hearing from the Word here? What we're hearing from Scripture? What do you think about when you hear that Word? Should we be more conscious to maybe not just translate the word church in the New Testament? Or should we be thinking about translating it in these kinds of ways? As a gathering or an assembly, would that change and shift things for you? Because just because there's a church sign out in front of a building, it does not mean that there is a people functioning as God's household inside of the building. So if the first thing that we think about when we hear the word church is a building or a place that we go, then we need to rethink it and go deeper because it is not necessarily a place that is filled with a functioning body of believers. It may be. We hope that it is. We work toward that. We here at Zion are working hard toward that. But it is a battle. It's a grind sometimes. And you got to work it out. So not just a building, but also not just an organization or a denomination. So we can take this one step deeper. You see, we've applied the language of church over the course of 2,000 years to describe big organizations and big denominations. And at best, I want to be fair here, our buildings and our things and our organizations can be good gifts that the Lord has given to us to steward. But the key is that we have been gifted them to steward and to bless the community, and to bless the world. 
That's why God would give us things that we can use that would be helpful as a body of believers, as a church. Jesus did not come to establish an institution. Jesus did not come to establish a denomination. Jesus came to establish his kingdom, and Jesus came to form a new people. So when those people live as kingdom people, when we do, and we live as a new humanity in Christ, we can set up structures and organizations, of course, that bless people and bless the world. But we have to keep the focus on what it is. It's us in relationship with the Lord. And then flows the blessings. So the church is the household and the dwelling of God. A family, if you will, who from the beginning offered people the love and the healing presence of the triune God. And so I want to just read a little bit from Scripture right now to describe what the early church understood to be the action of this. The action. They welcomed in strangers. They welcomed in sick people in order to help them to heal well. Sick maybe in the body, but also in the mind or psychologically or emotionally. That The church was a place of healing. And it was a place that invited in sinners, of course, because that's where we received the ultimate healing. So listen to the way the book of Acts describes the action of the church. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, so they read the scriptures like we do. They had fellowship with one another. They developed and they nurtured real and close relationships with one another. They gathered for the breaking of bread and the sharing of meals daily in their homes as well. They shared food with generous hearts. And a real challenge for us today, they shared all things in common. Do you notice the word things there? So it's not that material things are bad but it's that they are meant to be shared. And if they're not shared and they're held on to, then it can become a destructive reality. So they shared them. They brought their possessions and their belongings, laid them at the feet of the apostles, and they shared with those in need. And they experienced God's miraculous healing in their midst. That's what the scriptures say about what it meant for the church to be the church from the beginning. And so there's a natural challenge for us here. Some of this makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable, right? I know it makes me feel uncomfortable even standing here and talking about it. The early church lived what it preached. Do we live what we preach? That's a question that the church always has to face, forever, until kingdom come. They knew the social and the physical risks of being a refuge for people, of being a hospice, a hospice for people, a rest home, if you will, for broken people, where they could be healed. It's a mess, right? You ever been to a hospice, a refuge, a hospital? It's not a clean and tidy place. It's a place where broken people are being healed. And that's what the church was from the beginning. That's the definition. So they stepped out in faith and they redefined a common word and gave it a meaning like this. They counted the cost and they sacrificially offered Christ's love and his welcome to people, to real people. God's people have always known the inherent dangers associated with living into our identity and calling. Let me repeat that. God's people have always known the inherent dangers associated with living into our identity and calling. It's risky business being the church for real. Is it not? 
to love is to risk being hurt. If you are married or have children or you have a parent, which includes everybody, I think, then you know what I'm talking about here. There is an, an inherent risk in loving, in stepping out and being willing to love. Think about people divorcing and families being broken apart. That's the risk. Apply it to the church. The New Testament does. To truly live is to engage the dangerous world in which we live. Because the world is a dangerous place. Christ's church, it simultaneously and mysteriously is the safest and the most dangerous place on earth. It's the safest and the most dangerous place. Why? Because it is the place where the living God dwells. Where the spirit of transformation dwells. That wants to change our lives from the inside out. It's safe and it's dangerous. It's where strangers are welcomed in. Strangers can hurt you. Strangers can betray you. Strangers have to become friends and then people who are beloved. And sometimes the journey from stranger to beloved is a really messy journey. The church, that's the church. A place where forgiveness is offered. An important word in our time. We've got to forgive one another and show grace where the suffering are cared for. And most important, where the spiritually dead are raised to life. That's the church. That's the place where the living God dwells. That's the work that God does within his people. He gives spiritually dead people like us new life so that we are raised with Christ and we can do this thing together. And so, God holds before us a question. It is a difficult and a challenging question. It is not only our question, it is the question for all ages, but it's specific to us right now. And I'll put it to you this way. Are we living as God's household in our time? We've got to all check this. Are we living as the household? Are we being God's healing presence in our age of isolation, of dislocation, of separation, and of fear? That is our age. Are we being the healing presence of Jesus in that place of pain? Because suffering and sickness and fear and death, worst of all, death, is nothing new to the human experience. It is something that we will all share with our brothers and sisters down through the ages. At some point in time, the question is, from God to us, in the midst of it all, are we being his people? That's the question that I feel that the Lord is placing before us this morning. Being and becoming who Christ is for you. I want to share a couple of stories with you. Uh, two helpful illustrations. I hope they're helpful. They are small, but if we can't do the small things, we'll never do the big things, right? Does everybody agree with me on that one? If you don't take the baby steps, you can't take the big steps. And so this morning, um, some of you know that we've been having some car troubles recently. So we had another car trouble this morning. And the car that was parked in the driveway wouldn't start. And so 
I had to get my wife and my son, and we had to push the car out of the driveway, and unfortunately, it was in the front way, so it was really hard to get it out, and parallel park it on the road to get towed, if you can imagine that. So there we are, and we're literally pushing the car out of the driveway and trying to get it parallel on the street, which took us a little while. When we were on the street, the car was in the middle of the street. So thankfully, it's not a busy street, but it's a street. There's two people that walk down the road, down the middle of the road toward us. Okay? At the exact moment, on a Sunday morning at like 8.30 in the morning, going to the mailbox. The mailbox is right across the street from our house like 10 feet from where the car is. And you want to know what these people did? I will not tell you how old they are. I will not tell you their gender, and I will not tell you their race. These people walked down the street, and I kid you not, they put their head down, and they walked over to the mailbox, and they chatted with each other. They walked right by my car. They put their key in the mailbox. They got the crap out of their mailbox, They put their head down, and they walked home. They walked home. And they left us standing in the street. So we had to go. They didn't have to do anything, right? I get it. They didn't have to. But they could have. So we went over to another neighbor and asked for help. The husband came out. He's a big guy. He helped us move the car really quick. And I came over to the church. So this morning, I came in, and, like, I was a little flustered, you know. Um, But I thought, I've got a counter story for this sermon. So if you you want a picture of what it looks like to not be the people of God and the household of faith, that's it right there. I was given, it was given as a gift to me this morning to share with you. Don't help people. Put your head down and ignore them. Put the key in your mailbox, get your belongings, and let them figure out their life. But that will not be the church. That will not be the people of God. A counterexample. It was in the e-connection this week. I didn't even know about it. I think Jacqueline and somebody else mentioned it in a couple of meetings in the past weeks. So a few weeks ago, I stood here during Advent and I talked about the growing issue of homelessness in our city and in our country and the world, of course. And I talked about how, of course, we give out food, but we also sometimes give out tents and we give out sleeping bags. So again, it's a little example. It's the small things, right? So apparently there was a lady who was online and worships with us online. And she heard the sermon. She was moved by the word. She went out. She bought a bunch of really good sleeping bags, hoping that it could be distributed with those in need in the community. She came over. She dropped them off. And then our brother, our dear brother, who is here, but I will not say who, he came and he took a few of them And he went out onto the street, and he found a few people that really needed that gift, expression of what it means to be the church, put a couple of devotionals in each one of the bags with the sleeping bag, give people a little word of hope, and people were blessed. Small little thing. Or is it? Is it a big thing? Is it a seed that gets planted in the ground that grows into a fruit-bearing tree one day? I don't know. We don't know. That's the beauty of it all. It's the beauty of being the household of God. It's the beauty of abundance growing in the home and being shared with everybody. And what is the foundation as we land this thing this morning? It's the second image we got in this passage, which is that the church 
is a pillar and a buttress of truth. So where do we get everything that we're talking about this morning? We get it from the revealed word, which reveals the truth of the gospel to us. It shows us the Jesus who came and who did all of these things for us and on our behalf and gifted us with his spirit so that we would do it for one another. The church, the ecclesia, the gathering the assembly of the living God, with the mandate to bless the world as a pillar and a buttress of truth. The buttress is a support mechanism. Notice how this powerful little analogy, it links the imagery of home and of truth. Without truth, a home will not stay a home for long. It will become a disaster The main idea is strength and support in the home, for the home. Pillars help hold up the structure, while the foundation is what the house is built on, the support. Then you add things on top. So God has established his church to uphold and to steward and to proclaim the word of God the gospel of truth, the gospel of Jesus to the world. That's who we are. John chapter 4, chapter 14 and 17. These are the words of Jesus. If Rhonda, you could just bring up those passages, you can write these down. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth. He's the manifestation of truth. And then Jesus instructs us. As his people, those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. In the spirit and in truth. And then Jesus prays for us on the night that he was betrayed and killed. This is what he prayed. Listen to this. Father, sanctify them. Set them apart. He prayed this for you. Set them apart in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them out into the world as bearers of truth and justice. That's Jesus' prayer for you. So that you can do it. So that we can be this. And then Peter, who was so impacted by Jesus, he writes this later. Having purified your souls... By obedience to the truth, the truth of the gospel, for a sincere and brotherly love. You see it coming together there? Love one another earnestly. Love one another fiercely. From a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. There's the connection again. The Word, the truth, and the call to action. The call to love. And James chapter 1, he says this, Put away all filthiness and wickedness and receive with humbleness the implanted Word which is able to save your souls. One of my favorite theologians, John Stott, he sums all of this up in one sentence. He says this, The church depends on the truth for its existence. The truth depends on the church for its defense and proclamation. The church depends on the truth for its existence. It's why we're here. But the truth depends on us for its defense and proclamation. So we've got to stand up and say something and do something. Or else we're not the church. Correct? So the living God has set us apart and established us as 
a household of faith that is a pillar and buttress and support of truth. We worship God in truth. Therefore, if we diminish the gospel, if we diminish this whole message that God has given us about what it means to be the church, there is no church anymore. It's gone. It evaporates. It becomes another part of the secular society. If the truth goes, the church goes. So capitulation to cultural trends, to public opinion, and shifting political sands will kill the church in any given geographical area. I know that we have different opinions. I know that we have different political ex- persuasions. I know that we are all influenced by different cultural trends. But if we let that be the defining point, we are dead in the water. So we can't. And we won't. Instead, our Lord Jesus, the, re- the Redeemer of a diverse humanity, across culture, across race, across religion, across denomination, that Jesus calls us on the exciting journey of following Him. Him. He challenges us, and he says, follow me. And then he says, I'm going to send you out into this dangerous world to be sheep among wolves. Don't conform. Be conformed to my image, and then you'll be the transforming presence. You'll be the household. You'll be the pillar and the buttress of truth. So I conclude with this word this morning. The church, we, the people of God, are at our best when we stand with people as the household. And as we stand for the gospel as the pillar and support that we are. Always confessing the great mystery of godliness focusing squarely on Christ, who is our Lord. Christ, who is revealed in the flesh, who is vindicated in the Spirit, who is lifted from the grave through the power of God, who was seen by angels and worshipped, who was proclaimed among the nations with our own lips, and believed on in the world, and who was taken up in glory. He is your glory. He is your salvation. He is your leader. He is your guide. Let us follow him faithfully. Would you pray with me?